Hello and welcome to Angel's Costumes Behind the Scenes. I'm Jeremy Angel. I'm Richard Green. And I'm Jonathan Littman. This week I'm really happy to be releasing my interview with Matt Price. Matt is a costume designer who's been designing for over 10 years. He actually started his career at Angel's. He had two stints here. He started for a little bit, then left, and then came back again, and then left again, and came back as a customer. There's a precedent for that, Jonathan, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Six months. <laughs> as I keep reminding everybody, an, an in, interrupted service. So, so it, it's the John, it's the Jonathan Lippman way. We start start at Angels, leave, and come back. Is that what it was? Yeah, sixty years ago. Okay. <laughs> Matt has definitely done things his own way. After leaving Angels, didn't really do the assistant designing route that much. He basically started off as a designer working on music videos and commercials and working his way up and then getting TV and film. Uh, we discuss that journey and how things have slightly changed for him. We also get to discuss some of the projects he's worked on, including Brexit, which was a really interesting job for him to work on. And one of my favorite jobs that he's worked on just for my purely own selfish interest, which was fighting with my family, which is uh, a wrestling film and I'm a bit of a wrestling nut. And uh, it was great to work on that with Matt as well. And we just talk about Matt and designing and his views on things. It's a really interesting chat and I hope you all enjoy it. We hope you've been enjoying these conversations. We've definitely been enjoying your feedback. So please do keep sending it to us. If you have any questions or requests, please email them to podcast at angels.co.uk. You can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are forward slash costume podcast. And if you would like to visit our website, it is www.angelsbehindthescenes.com. And here is my interview with Matt Price. I'm talking today to Matt Price. Matt is a costume designer. He's been designing for over 10 years now. He worked at Angels for a small period of his career before he started designing. And I'm looking forward to talking to Matt about, about everything and just Matt himself. So Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks very much. Um, so the point of the podcast, what we've been doing is it's... We're, we're trying to highlight to everyone just how costume works and the different ways into the uh, the industry for costume and the different roles that exist in it and how, how important each individual one is. And the the nice way we like to start all of this is just to, to ask where where did it all start for you? Where did you train or how, how, how did, when did costume come onto the horizon for you? Well, I actually started doing a foundation at uh, Hereford Art College and that took in, you know, a load of of broader subjects but theatre design came up within that and Central St Martins was mentioned as a possible college so I kind of I worked towards trying to get it into Central St Martins basically which is where I ended up doing a BA in theatre design. Was that course costume and set or was it just costume that theatre design course? It, it was more of a sort of a broad training really in set design, costume, drafting, script work, uh, you know a bit of lighting but towards the end of the third year I kind of naturally drifted towards costume and film really with a small focus on costume but it wasn't it wasn't the be all and end all I actually wanted to go on and study photography after that actually funny enough. Mm. and then um, you were you were at uni at one point with Nat weren't you yeah he was actually the year above me at St Martin's yeah he was uh so we spent quite a bit of time together there and uh obviously followed on into Angels and, and, and since, really. So you, you followed him to uni and he followed you to Angels? Yeah, I think it, I think it, I think it was that way around, actually, yeah. yeah. So, interest, just a round question, because it's come up on some of the talks we've had recently, actually. With the, the course, was how heavy is the set design side of things on that course? Is it quite heavy or is it something that you you can understand why it's linked or because that's, that's the, the question I keep raising when we're talking to designers who do both. It's just like, there's no other department anywhere with the exception of maybe hair and makeup, but mm. again, that's tenuous, I suppose, that combine. So it's just mm. how much pressure is put on you on the course that you have to do it this way. I think it was, it was way more heavy on the set design from my point of view. Um, mm. I kind of pushed towards the costume side of things towards the end of the degree, but it was definitely more focused on set design set. and the drafting. Um, a little bit of script work, but the, the costume was sort of secondary, I would say. And were you always, was it something from a young age you knew? I mean, I know you said you wanted to go to photography or anything. Was, what, mm. what, what point, where was the interest in costume to drive you to look to do the, the theatre course? Well, it sort of came from my love of photography from a young age, really. So I was sort of obsessed with 
photographers like Walker Evans and John Bulmer and Martin Parr mm. and, and more recently Billy Charity and you know these sort of documentary style photographers that had a sort of social realism edge to them and I was always sort of fascinated by the clothes within that really it kind of made sense for me to sort of combine both and push on and then you know when a chance came to work at Angels I sort of jumped at it really. It's interesting no one there's only I think out of everyone we've interviewed so far I think there's only one person who like from the age of like seven or eight said I want to be a costume designer right. everyone else has had all these um, these other things and they've sort of not found it by chance but it's not it's they've known they've wanted to do something that way and then yeah later on in their life they've, they've, they've found costume it's very interesting actually with 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 everyone we've spoken to yeah I mean I think there's a certain fluidity to most people's careers and even even working at Angels I wasn't actually even 100% sure if I ever wanted to go uh, freelance for example I was quite happy working away and learning and learning my trade and actually doing things outside of Angels sort of I was involved in sort of music promotion and that sort of thing on the side but actually funny enough that led when I did go freelance that sort of that went full circle and that's where I got my first positions sort of designing music videos and that sort of thing. And did you when you when you left Angels was it did you do four years here or was it a bit longer or shorter than that? A bit longer it was almost seven years in the end. Oh sorry, sorry I, I stole three <laughs> years away from you I apologize. Right. <laughs> I actually did two stints I did a small stint in Camden which is where I first met Bart Carrick mm. and then I lived abroad for a while, and I, when I came back, I did a much longer stint. Basically. Was that at Hendon that time? Was it still in, in Camden? At Hendon, that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I knew Sarah Prince sort of socially mm. um, outside work, and so I was lucky enough to be re-offered a job back. It's, we actually, we, I do talk about, it's actually very interesting when you look at the people you were working with at Angels at the time and the mm. group that you started with and sort of joined you throughout that seven years. If you look at where some of you guys are now, it's quite incredible, the the positions you guys are now obtaining and that you were all here at one point is just like it's it, it's quite quite interesting to look back on I mean just as a few examples there's you there's Nat there's Bart there's Holly and Ian mm. Fulcher and and mm. you're all now off designing doing what you're doing you've got Maria Smith and Mike Hodge and Mark Lord doing what they're and it's just like it's it, it's really interesting you were all here at one point and you're all now near the top of top of where you're, you are now so I, I find that really fascinating it was, must have been a great time to work with when you were working here as that group yeah it, it really was actually it was a fantastic time and there was a strong nucleus of, of uh, personalities at that time and and I think we really we are all quite strong personalities I would say and we were quite focused on kind of learning as much as possible and pushing forward and, and I think that's why we've all gone freelance and, and, and kind of pushed our careers really but I think we're all quite diverse as well got quite sort of similar yet different aesthetics in a way also aren't don't aren't the, that you're not nine to five people if that makes sense it's I, I always got the impression that you always had other things going on as well not to the detriment of anything but you you, you none of you stood still none no. of you would like to just do right I'm finished I'm going home put my feet up watching tv sort of thing you were all constantly moving and doing different things yeah we were well especially um Bart yeah. and Nat and myself we we were sort of involved in music on the outside and like I said before that was that was sort of an integral part of just being in London, really. You know, being sort of a young person in London, not from young London, is um, is a really exciting time. When you left the second time, did you go straight into the designing on the videos, or was there a small stint where you um you went as a standby or something like that? There was a small stint. Yeah, I had a job with Nick Eames. I did um, a feature called Me and Orson Wells over in the Isle of Man. So I did that, and I assisted Eric at Ockfist for a couple of things, but I. I I kind of all, I always knew that I just wanted to mm. design really. So I, I kind of went back to basics and just decided that I would almost start at the bottom and try and get some music videos and try and get some commercials. And so I, I went back to the sort of people I knew in music and managed to pick up some work there. But I also went knocking on doors. I used to go to production companies and see if I could get a meeting there. And I was quite kind of bullish about how I approached it really. And it paid off though with, with where you've got now. You've not the only thing I've looked at with with what, what you've done, the only thing I think you've not possibly done is a computer game. You might have done a commercial for a computer game. But I don't think I think if you look at your what you've done, I think you, you cover pretty much everything apart from a computer game and maybe a theatre production, but I could be wrong about a theatre production. It's <laughs> quite impressive when you look at it. It's yeah, everything's there. Yeah, I mean, we, funny enough, we did do a set of commercials for a computer game that we shot over in Bulgaria um, for the new PlayStation. But as far as theatre, yeah, I haven't, haven't touched on theatre yet, but I'd, I'd love to sort of go back and 
be given the opportunity at some stage, I must say. It's interesting. When I spoke with Susie Harmon, Susie said the same thing, which is she'd love to do theatre, but she knows the amount of risk it would be for the production to take on someone who hasn't done it, and she'd possibly yeah. need uh, it, just more time with it, which she didn't know she'd get. But I think it's it's always interesting to hear people would like to go back to theatre because most a lot of you guys, that was what you were trained in, which is it's just interesting. You never end up in it. You all end up in the other side of it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and also dance as well. We did sort of cover dance when we were doing our degree, and that's the side of things that... And, and opera as well, to be honest. So all those sort of three sort of subgenres would be kind of interesting to visit sometimes. I can understand that. So basically you almost started as a designer. How are things different with what you do today versus how they were when you started as a designer? Well, they've scaled up a little bit. It's the first um, aspect, really. So the budgets have, have increased and the crews have increased. That's, that's a major part. But I, I tend to kind of work in the same way because I was quite self-sufficient from the start and even going as far as actually driving the costume truck with all the clothes in it and doing, you know, one job I designed, I was supervising and doing standby. Wow. It was just myself. And and so I, I quite like that independence feel still. But as far as the crew's concerned, it's much more of a, much more complex these days with regards to getting the right balance with the crew and understanding budgets and, you know, working with that. Do you think that's, that's affected it or changed how you work or for the better or for the worse the fact that the crews are so much bigger I mean again I can only use the example of you worked you you were here at Angels just before the sort of the massive Harry Potter style things took off and all these huge crews took off with costume and it was much smaller it was more reliance on the costume houses at times and maybe a team of three rather than a team of 30. Uh, do mm. you do you find it's better or would you rather it was smaller again or what, what's your preference? Well, I think I think it's just different, really, to be honest. And you you, you apply the same techniques and methods to whether it's a you know three or four mm. crew team or or thirty. You know, we're currently shooting something that has a team of three essentially. So I'm doing um, an independent film at the moment, but we're kind of back to basics to a certain degree, and I'm mm. really enjoying doing that part of it again. So it, 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 I think you, yeah, you just apply the same techniques really. When you when you're when you're looking at the work and the volume of work you do, and you you you're another one that just doesn't stop. You go from job to job to job. I was I was quite impressed. You've just been on holiday because you normally don't. You're just always working. Normally, that's how I've always known is you're on another job. You're on another job. That's that's what Matt does. How do you choose your projects? I mean, the script is first and foremost mm. for me. Really, if I don't identify with the script and the themes within it, then it's difficult to get excited overall. But there's you know there's many other aspects to it like the director, cast members, HODs, you know, the production company, what type of audience it aims to reach. So you kind of need to take it all into account, really. Have you done a job before that you go, I really want to work with that cast member? I'm, I'm not too keen on maybe the director or the piece, but I want to work with, with whoever it might be. Has that happened for you? <laughs> um, no. I'm not asking for names or examples. <laughs> you know what, that hasn't, that, that, no, that, that hasn't happened for me, I must say. Um, it's... Uh, I tend to really be led by the scripts and I've been mm. lucky enough and fortunate enough so far that everything else has sort of fallen into fallen into place after that. The the stuff that you have worked on is it's extreme it is very, very rare. You've got your sci fi's, you've got your period, you've got your modern day. Do you have a preference and two things? Do you have a preference with um the period that you're you're working in and also do you have a preference designing for, the, for men or women? I mean, I know there's two completely different questions there, but... Um, I don't have a preference with periods, not at all, in fact, no. Um, I'm probably seen as someone who does slightly more contemporary projects, but I'd like to break free from that, I must say. I just think it's really about the script and about the design. And, you know, with the sort of formal training that I had at Angels, I think anyone who spends some time in Angels can come out and design any, any period, really. And when it comes to designing for men and designing for women, you have no, no preference? It's it's a shape, it's a body, and it's it, all it, part of everything? Exactly. It's a shape and it's a silhouette and, and it's a character. So uh, you almost don't distinguish between the two. I just look at it sort of separately to that in a way. Hmm. Is there um, a, a project that you've done that you've most enjoyed? Or is it always the, the, your, best pro your best one or your favourite one is the one you've just come off? Well, you get... Uh, I don't have a favourite as such because you get, <laughs> as you get so attached to projects, as they're almost like, kind of, um, you know, they sort of have a love affair with each project basically. But I would say the most enjoyable scene that I've shot was the fight with my family, where Florence uh, Pugh had to go out in front of twenty thousand real wrestling fans 
and we had 40, mm. 40 minutes to sort of shoot the sequence, which was kind of terrifying and electrifying all at the same time, really. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and keep quiet. You know I'm a wrestling nut, so I, I know exactly that one. And I still, one of my favourite calls was when you phoned us and said, I need a wrestling referee. And it's the first time in my life my, my one of my hobbies and work came in and I could go, which one? WWE, WCW, is it in 1980, 1990? And it was, I, the reply from you was just, I just want a, ref, a wrestling shirt, <laughs> Yeah, I must say I wasn't like a huge fan of wrestling before that project, yeah. but but afterwards, yeah, you certainly you certainly have an appreciation for it. For you with the team, do you have a set team that you always work with, or do you, do you like switching up the people you're you're working with? I have um I have a backbone that I've worked with quite regularly over the years, and um, I do like to work with new people and give people a chance. And but I, yeah, I certainly have a backbone, especially with supervisors, mm. because they're so crucial. You know, just for everything for the logistics and the running of the day-to-day crew. So yeah, there's, there's a bit of both really, to be honest. And do you you also have assistant designers with you on your projects or is that something you, you're not too keen on doing when you're, you're working on a project? No, absolutely keen to have an assistant designer. It really mm-hmm. depends on the budget, to be honest. So for example, at the moment, I don't have an assistant designer, but on the Netflix job I did recently, we had one on that. So it, it really depends on, on, on the size of the budget when it comes to that position. But that's why quite often a supervisor on a slightly lower budget, maybe like an indie project or something, is, is so integral because they'll kind of fill two roles to a degree. How, how involved do you get with, on, on the productions, if we, we take the Netflix one or we take one of the, um, one of your, the bigger projects you work on, how, how involved do you get with the, the hiring of the department as a whole? Or do you, do you let the supervisor run with it and you go, I trust you, or is it, I want this person and the rest of you can choose? How, how involved do you get? I get involved to a degree. Um, usually with the starting team, I'll be quite involved because it's really important for me to have, uh, you know, an open, approachable team and for everyone to feel comfortable. Usually as we get into a shoot, if we're, you know, hiring dailies and maybe we need a crowd team to come on, I'll be less involved with that side of things, usually just because I'm so busy. But that's where trust comes in with the supervisor, really. So. When it comes to making and stuff like that, how involved do you get with the making? Because I know your course would have maybe touched it briefly, mm. but it wasn't a making course. Yeah. But Yeah, I mean, absolutely hands-on with all the makes, really. That's an area that I love doing, from the sourcing of the fabrics to the fittings for it. And, you know, all, all of that area is something that, I'm absolutely there for essentially. Is that something you'd like to to add to your? Is there anything that you because every every, every day is almost like a, every there's something new to learn every day. Is there, there a direction for you that you think that's actually at the moment I think I'd love to know how to do this more or I want to know more about that. Is there any on is, is there anything like that for you that's you, you've come across and actually make me a better designer if I could do this and you spent more time looking at it. Well, I think we're all, we're all constantly learning and that's part of the joy of the job, really. Um, I would say period-wise, I would, I would love to move towards a bit more of a period, uh, more period projects, essentially, where we could possibly have more makes and, and move towards that style of, of costuming. With the work that you do and when you come across it, how, how, uh, how, how important are the relationships you have with the costume houses? I'm, I'm not just talking us angels and mm. obviously I'm biased towards angels and <laughs> for obvious reasons, but uh, how important is the relationship for you guys uh, on a project or with the costume houses? Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, it's massive, it's crucial. I mean, I consider angels really an extension of the costume crew, really, to be honest. So, and, you know, dealing with the budget, from the start of the project is 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 so important and being able to sit down with you guys and just be open and talk about the restrictions or the makes possible you help you help realize the jobs for me really and also it takes the pressure off knowing that you know we can lean back on you um if we've got any problems with some of your projects like if you take writing my family or brexit for example mm. that's that's past story and therefore it's sort of um the, the vision's sort of not 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 out of your control, but people know what it should look like because yeah. it's it's fact, as it were. Yeah. How with with projects that aren't like that, how how much relevance do you on those sort of projects that you do? Do you do you want to put on the actual accuracy of it, or even within those projects, how much relevance do you want in the the accuracy, or do you want? Well, everyone knows the story. It doesn't matter how it looks. I can do this, or what? what how 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 does that work for you? Well, I mean. <laughs> It's that thing of kind of knowing the periods to, to work outside of them to a certain degree, number one. Um, the accuracy uh, point is really a, an overall discussion with the director, number one. Because mm. even, for example, with Fighting for My Family, we knew what 
Florence's character wore. So we'd made all the all the sort of the wrestling outfits that she'd wore. We decided to make them as per as accurate as per. Mm. So they were spot on. And then 48 hours before we shot that final scene, we actually decided to create our own cage. Um, mm. So it's it's you tend to kind of you you tend to be driven by the, the actual character that you're designing for as well. And maybe there'll be sort of slightly blurred lines when it comes to that. And you, you've worked on several TV series, and some of them, um, and a lot of them have actually gone on to do more than one, one season. Um, but you, you, you tend to work on just one, one of the seasons. You, mm. um, unless I'm wrong, I apologise if I'm wrong. You don't tend to go back for a second time. You then move on to your next one. Mm. Is that just a choice that you've made? That if, if that is a choice that you can make, I mean, it, it, I don't mean to sort of be rubbing salt if it was the production, but you yeah. you know the question I'm asking, do you want to go back? Because you know some designers, when they get hold of, take Michelle, for example, when she was on Game of Thrones, she oh. did that for quite a few years, yeah. quite a few seasons and things. Is that something that doesn't really, as far as you've done, you've done your season, you've established your your feel for it, and then you want to move on? Yeah, for me at the moment, it's and, and for the style of projects I've um, designed within those the, sort of the TV series land, yeah. I've always kind of wanted to move on afterwards, really. But that's not to say in the future that would be the case. Um, you know, if it was something on the scale of Game of Thrones, then I could absolutely mm -hmm. see why you'd want to return to do a second series or a third series. One of the pieces you've done is extremely sci-fi and futuristic. And how much of a challenge is that to your normal, to, to you? Because it's... I, I, look, you, people can specialise in that after doing a certain few amount of projects, but there's no way anyone can come to something that's set in the future and go, "Oh, that's in my wheelhouse." The first time I'm doing it, sort of thing. It's mm. uh, how, how do you how do you approach something that's that? Is that the sort of project you'd like to get your teeth in that you can? Th th there's no there's no boundaries at all, and you can actually have fun with it. Or is it something that's absolutely daunting because there's no boundaries and <laughs> <laughs> um, it could go any direction. Yeah, I mean, it's a mixture of the both again, really. It, 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 I suppose it is daunting, but it's also um, so exciting in the, in the sense that you can look at, you can go anywhere for research, really. You could look at old Grecian paintings or you can, you know, visit museums and look at something that was thousands of years old and say, that's an interesting silhouette. Why don't we look at that? So I think it kind of works both ways again, really. I know you, you you like any period or you, you enjoy working in any period and you, you've trained in every period. Is mm. is there anything in your head that you sit there and go, I wish I could work on a project like X or you, you speak to your agent and you say, can you try and get me this sort of project? Well, in recent times, um, the HBO series Chernobyl massively mm. stands out for me. That's gorgeous. Yeah, That's it's really gorgeous. gorgeous. And just the accuracy and detail and breakdown of the clothes are fantastic. And I just found that a very, very powerful piece. So I'd, I'd love to be able to have the chance to design something on that scale, basically. I love the fact it wasn't glamorized, really, to be honest. So it, it's the sort of, uh, I know we've spoken about the historical actuality earlier, but it's something that's mm. such a story that's ingrained and, and the accuracy is so important to the story because you, you're right, it's so, there's no glorification at all of it. It's, no. it's the worst thing possible. So you can actually have, you can expose everything. You can go, so that's the sort of thing, re completely real, mm. honest yeah, period. Yeah, exactly. And I, re I really remember like the minor scenes um, from that series as well. That sort of really stood in my mind, just the horrificness of it all. But I felt, you know, they just went there and, and didn't put it any sort of sheen on it which was great it's interesting is there histor with, with historical pieces it's, it's like some people we've spoken to have had the opportunity to work on pieces that actually affected them or they they lived through is that again something that you'd like a challenge or something you've lived through to actually not experience but grew up with that you'd be able to go i can finally put my twist on a story that had such an impact during my life or was going on when I was growing up, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would be sort of fascinating to do something that's almost based around what's going on now, to be honest. Um, mm. I wonder if in sort of, I know that they're sort of looking at making a few bits and bobs to do with sort of coronavirus, but I wonder in a few years time, how we look back on this situation and and um, tackling, tackling, you know, what's going on now would be fascinating, really. I mean, I suppose you've already had that with Brexit as well, with that piece. How, how was that working on something that was such a hot topic at the time? Yeah, I mean, it was quite daunting, number one, because you kind of think, you know, is it too soon to touch on this subject? But really, with the, the story kind of based from Dominic Cummings' point of view to a degree, I don't think a lot of people had really heard of, too much about him at the time. 
obviously mm. now we kind of you know he's he's uh, in the news every other day as it were but so there's a certain sensitivity to how we approach that and you, you could almost look at a project like that and just say well it's just men in suits really but actually all those characters wear their clothes for specific reasons you know you've only got to look at someone like Farage for example with the sort of the 90s bank manager look that he's got it's um everything is sort of contrived within the wardrobes of those guys so that that makes make just providing suits if we're going to use that horrible phrase just just suits at least a bit more interesting for you, you can get a bit more creative with the story you're telling with the clothing yeah exactly exactly there's a narrative within the clothing and um and it's yeah, i think it really shows in that piece as well really just the sort of the fine touches within each character um, they're, they're all there for a reason, basically. And have you do you do you ever play around with the color palette to help help the narrative as well? Is that something you like to lean on, or is that something that's it's it's there but it's not as important to you as no, the narrative? It, it can be absolutely if you're if you're trying to show hope or if you're trying to show anger or if there's certain scenes that mean something emotionally, then the palette will always be a discussion. And even if you're playing with characters that are that you have the footage of these characters. It doesn't mean that you can't tweak them in that moment, you know. It's, it's interesting. It's colour palette and things like that are all things... It sounds weird. We take for granted. We understand mm. them, but don't realise the wider world, don't realise at times why certain items stand out so much in a film isn't because everything else isn't worth it. It's because you, you, the design, has been so clever with what you've done with the colour palette that the second that enters the scene, yeah. everyone can see this costume. So it's a, it's a fantastic tool that you guys use. And I think more people should realise about how clever you can be with colour. Yeah, of course. And it's not just costume. You know, that's, it's a collaborative experience. So mm. say there's a pop of colour on a particular character, Obviously, we would have worked that out with the director and the and um, the production designer and hair and makeup. And there's a there's a there's an overall palette that comes into account. You know, I've said earlier on, you're very busy. You're always working. I don't think I've known you to stay still for two weeks or longer than two weeks. You're always on to the next production. But how hard do you find switching off? How hard do you find the the, the phrase is the work life balance? Mm. How how do you deal with the demands of our industry, the demands on your career, because you wanted to get somewhere very quickly, which you did, and then you want to stay there and move further. Mm. But by staying sane and actually having time to you, how does that work for you? Well, I, I mean, I did go back to back on a few projects, sort of uh, more in the start of my career, really. But really, I now make a, you know, like a conscious effort after every project to try and switch off, to try and reset, to try and rejuvenate, mm. because because there is an element that could be seen as burnout, for example. Um, yeah. And I don't think it benefits anyone when you're joining a project, A, being just, you know, work to the bone, and B, for friends and family. So that you have to be aware. And also, obviously, it's not just about work. And it, it's, it's amazing. It's the one skill that's never taught to you. There's no, nothing that can teach you you need to stop because you, you, you hear people say it and it's just like, yeah, 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 of course. But until you, you're the one who has to action it. so Yeah, exactly. And I think it's a hard thing to, 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 to really teach someone anyway, because until you're you know, physically out there doing the hours, it's impossible to kind of understand what that feels like to a degree. And I suppose age comes into someone's already said to us that being a standby is a young person's game. <laughs> Uh, for me, it was running is definitely a young person's game. I think the older the older you get, and the, 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 when the roles change, you've really got to look at it quite closely because it's so easy at the beginning of your career doing things like that. You do try and run through yeah. brick walls, but you need to learn. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think everybody does it. I think everyone goes through a stage where they maybe do hit a slight brick wall and kind of actually mm -hmm. reset and you know rethink things. Maybe throughout your career, you mentioned Nick Ede earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, are there any designers? that were really helpful to you when you started out or even as you still go? I mean, because other people uh, have mentioned designers uh, that they've worked with or have been instrumental to their career. Are there, are there people that you you felt are were, were real help to you when you were coming through? Well, uh, the sort of clearest uh, memories actually go back to Angels, to be honest, because I, because I started designing, I didn't really assist that much in a way. I kind of went a slightly different path. When, mm -hmm. I, when I was in the house at Angels, Richard Davis, was um, my boss at the time and he essentially taught me the fundamental principles of costume that I still carry around with me and they are things like how to measure accurately and you know with and without a tape measure how to line up a rail of clothes how to set up and run a fitting room how to look at an overall palette you know how to question a, an item of clothing and I always go back to a, a lot of these sort of 
which might sound simplistic in a way, but they're absolutely not. They're a set of rules that you carry around with you. How, how did that interview go with Richard? Was it as some people before have just said, literally, it was a, it was quite a simple process? Or how, with with your interview with Richard and with Angels, was it a very simple thing, or is it a, did you jump through twenty five hoops? No, it did. I, I I remember it being quite simple in a way. I think it's maybe because I knew Sarah. Um, mm. So I had maybe a slight in, as it were. <laughs> and I think Bart was already working at Angels, or Nat maybe was already working at Angels. So it kind of, yeah, it didn't feel too daunting at the time, I must say. When I first started working at Angels, that was a different story. That was a real realisation of what I needed to learn. And where was Daniel in the department when you started? Where was, where was he at the time? I think he was in men's period. I think. Okay. So, yeah, because you, you, we, we, we've mentioned before, you guys had quite a formidable team in that contemporary department to begin with that you you came through with it in a good way. Yeah. Please don't take that as meaning a negative <laughs> way. <laughs> no, I think we had, a, we had a good core and I think we bounced off each other and we were very upbeat and, you know, we, we were a good... We were a good gang, I would say. Yeah, very up. I don't think there's a single... I mean, any of the lot who worked with you... I was talking about it the other day with someone. Andy Andrea was actually already here when you were there mm, that's right. as well. So there's, there's a, it was a lovely... It is, it not just was, it is a lovely group of people yeah. you came through with. Yeah, it is. So apart from Richard, was there, was, was, was there anyone else? Or, or it was more you fended for yourself, as it were? Uh... Um, it, there was a little bit of that, actually, yeah. Because, I, yeah, like I said, I just didn't really do the assisting role as such. I did learn a lot off um, uh, Claire Barnard, the director. Um, mm. I was lucky enough to work with her as one of my first features. And we had a sort of a natural dialogue when it came to sort of clothes and, and what, what things should mean to us and to the audience. So that was a really interesting process. And I learned a lot from her. And I remember she said one day that, that we were talking about breakdown levels on a costume. And she said, oh, this character should wear mud with pride. Um, <laughs> And I thought that was a really interesting way to describe a breakdown <laughs> on clothes. Mud with pride. Yeah, I like yeah. that. that. That can get added to our list. We've got random things that have come up on these interviews. Smell the room, mud with pride. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Print some T-shirts, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And before I get to the last question um, about advice, if but the question for yourself if you had to do it all again, would you still go the route of non-assisting and starting on the music videos and commercials that way as a designer, or would you try and do the assisting side? I think I would stick to how I've done it personally. Yeah, I mean, for me, it kind of it, it suited how I worked. Mm. So I, you know, I think there's so many different routes you can take, and there's not one correct way. But I think if you find something that you feel comfortable with, and I felt very comfortable you know, going that route essentially is slightly more independent, slightly more DIY, as it were. Um, that really suited me. And finally, is there, is there any advice you'd give anyone who wants to start a career in costume, whether it's don't, uh, whether it's... Uh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> uh, don't. Um, is there, there any advice you'd give anyone who's thinking of starting a career in costume? Well, I think, you know, you have to be inquisitive. You have to learn your craft. I wouldn't be afraid to approach designers that you admire. Um, mm. I would always say stay, you know, be open and be passionate. And and I think really don't compare yourself to anyone. Just, you know, be an individual. Mm. No, that that's, I mean, that's really good advice. And it's the, the, the passion. It's, it's, it's very interesting listening to how people talk about it. If they don't say don't. Um, and it's it's nice to hear everyone doesn't seem to be too threatened by new people. They just want them no. to enjoy the experience, but make sure you you graft, make sure you learn it exactly. all properly before you dive two feet exactly. in. I would say on a practical level as well. There's you know there's organisations like skill sets that give you physical work placements, and you know like angels do internships. Um, mm. You know these these types of things are crucial to entering the industry. So there's other ways in as well. And and I I suppose the one thing people need to take away is yes, we are from angels, as in myself, Rich and Jonathan. But the the you're a perfect example. Nat's a perfect example. Bart's a perfect example. You come here, you learn your craft, you make the connections while you're working here, and then those are the well aside from you, but for the others, those are the connections that once you leave angels mm. that that's where it all comes into its for into its own so it's okay. it's always about not being too scared to 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 stop to learn but you'll still be making those contacts and Absolutely. using it i think if you've got your eyes open and you're you know young and passionate and especially being in an amazing city like london you will there will kind of be a slight kind of a natural feed of people that you'll meet along the way anyway mm. and gravitate towards yeah. that little 
little crew that you have. Well, Matt, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend answering my questions. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate that. Well, he's very good. He's a nice guy, isn't he? I, do, I like Matt. I mean, I, I've got to stop confusing the names, Nat and Matt. So obviously, they were here at the same time. And Nat has told me off several times because I think I do it more to Nat than I do to Matt. Oh, I thought it was your speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was uh, Matt's. It, it's, it's always it's always fun when Matt comes in. I, I like working with Matt. He has done a lot of contemporary things, but as he admitted on the talk, he wants to be seen. He doesn't want to be seen as a contemporary designer. He'd like he he wants to get other periods and other things under his belt. And and that's what he'd like to start doing as well, a bit more non-contemporary. It's a, it's an interesting career traje trajectory because of the, you know, it's all it's all gone in the right direction. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting what you say, though, about that whole sort of group that, that, that sort of came out. Mm. No, it, it is. And it, mm. it's that when you, you look at it, as I, I know I keep harping on, but I, I still think it's quite quite impressive and even the ones who aren't designers are, are top of the field of what they do and uh, at their position so it's a it's a really impressive group of people that you guys it was you uh, it was both of you um Richard uh Richard Davis and and that was your department yeah I know I was listening to the interview and I thought hang on a minute I didn't I didn't interview him for his job because of course there are other Richards aren't there well, there were yes. and at that point within the department there was a, it was it, it was a quite an expanded team because they were very busy and they also fed into other areas of the men's ladies civilian costume department when did they combine when did because matt matt clearly states oh he was he was in the contemporary department and when asked about daniel or well, daniel was in the uh men's period when did we just combine if, uh, i think it combined men's and women's and then it's just combined as civilian and uniform now but when, when did that happen it was when we when we moved to Henry. in camden we had the different floors so you just differentiated between the the you know if you wanted military it was on the yeah board. It was more site specific in yeah. terms of how yeah. the departments were managed, yeah. whereas coming to Hendon in terms of what we had as an as a as a blank canvas, in terms of creating the warehouse space, it was more to do with uh, uh, administration rather than yeah. Uh, yeah. location. And also, as as time moved forward, and you know, people came and went and moved on, and you know. Richard and Seth and Sarah Prince and Peter Cameron and Richard Day. Yeah. And also, of course, you know, traditionally men did men's costumes and women did ladies' costumes and and, and rightly well, the end until of the until yeah. you got to the contemporary department where where we yeah. all we all did both. And yeah. that was part of the remit. And uh, of course you had your interests, you had your strengths, but essentially the job involved supplying costumes for both men and women and i th i thought you would have appreciated jonathan when he was talking about brexit about the with when he was talking about it wasn't just men's suits that there's a narrative to each of the suits and the choices that the the people in real life make with why they're wearing it and everything and and just a little bit explaining that it's not just men in suits there were stories behind it which people often miss which i i, I know is something you're you you do like exploring and talking about as well is the the narrative, the narrative is one of the most important parts for you, the costume. And I just, I found yeah. it really interesting yeah. talking about the Brexit film and Nigel Farage and the, the narrative of his suits and the way he wears his suits. Yeah, and how, how he wants to be perceived and where he shops and, you know, mm. where, where you, can, you can imagine him in some home county environment on a Saturday afternoon in some high street and <laughs> where, he, where he would pick up his barber and his yellow jumper and... You know what, what, what lovely message he would impart to whoever he would be talking to. I, I know you're talking about Nigel there. And you're not talking about Matt. <laughs> Matt. So um, I do think. Yeah, we're moving on to character. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the narrative conversation with costume within the costume and also the color palette is, is something I think if we can find a way of delving into a little bit more, I think it would well, be... Well, Jonathan can, Jonathan can talk about that. He's a guy. can bore our audience with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm only really interested in the colours khaki, field grey, <laughs> navy blue. 
<laughs> Ollie's grad. Um, so don't ask me. But on a serious note, I mean, it was interesting and it is interesting. And it's something that doesn't occur to me that, you know, different colours reflect reflect people's mood and people's narrative, I suppose, for want of a, another word. Well, it's, yeah, it's but, yeah. psychology of clothing. Because you think about all that stuff, whereas I worry about whether the braid's on the right way around and the stripes are upside down. So, you know, it's a different thing. I'm glad you all enjoyed the conversation with Matt. And as I said, there's lots that came out of it, which I really enjoyed doing. And the next interview we're going to be releasing is Richard's with Philip Goldsworth. Or Goldie. Yes, yeah. I wanted to talk to, to Phil because, again, yet another person who's come at it from a different angle. But interestingly, one of the few people who've actually spoken to any of us and said, yeah, I wanted to be in films from the age of about six, seven. As I say, most of us seem to kind of stumble into it by mistake or through our mothers. So, uh, yeah, it's a good interview, I think. And, um, you know, he's been around the block. If you IMDB him and look at his list of credits, it's phenomenal. And it's quite interesting about the production that he didn't work on, which everybody thinks he did. Hmm. Well, uh, here is a small excerpt of Richard's conversation with Philip Goldsworthy. You know, within wardrobe, there's, there's that opportunity to move within the department you know and um because i came from making background that's why bloomfield kind of like well he'd be good at making that and going on set and you know they'd use you you know and why not but i think most of my career the last 25 odd years has been on set and and i i do love the set not just with mucking around with costume people, but working with camera people and directors and great props and art directors and obviously travelling around. And I wouldn't have seen half the places I have seen if I hadn't been in the film industry. So I'm grateful for that, to have gone to countries that you wouldn't think of going to. 